give you a little context. Think of this as a love story and also a call and response. The first two readings will be God's call. The last one will be our response. From the Song of Solomon, chapter 4. A garden locked is my sister, my bride, a garden locked, a fountain sealed. Your channel is an orchard of pomegranates with all choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all chief spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. From chapter five. I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk with love. From chapter seven. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O my beloved. Slide, please. Okay, fess up. How many of you knew there was a book of, called the Song of Solomons in the Hebrew Bible? Really? Wow. You know, that happened at 9 o'clock, too. I, hear, I thought I was confessing something really great that everybody would feel good about because they did it, too, and I think I'm the only one. When I first had to preach on the Song of Solomon for the first time, which isn't this time, it was before, I didn't know that Song of Solomon was its own book. So much for the education system, right? I probably heard it somewhere, but I always thought of the Song of Solomon as being a part of another book, kind of like the Song of Miriam and Moses, which is in Exodus 15, right? Song of Miriam and Moses is not its own book, it's a part of another book. Or the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, right? That's found in the Gospel of Luke. See, education's kicking in now, right? Right? So that's how I always thought of the Song of Solomon, is that it was a part of another book. So when I went to go find it, I looked in 1 Kings. That's where it should be, right? That's all about Solomon. He was a king. It's a Song of Solomon, 1 Kings. It wasn't there. I had to go look it up, and I thought, found out that it is indeed, can you do the next slide, part of the Hebrew Bible. In fact, it's the 22nd book of the Hebrew Bible. It's a small little book of eight chapters, and it's snuggled down in between Ecclesiastes and the really big prophetic book of Isaiah, which is why it gets lost all the time, right? Um, it is the very last of what the Hebrew Bible considers wisdom literature in its writings. It is, that includes books like Job and Proverbs and Psalms and Ecclesiastes. And now you know the Song of Solomon is also there. It's also called the Song of Songs. Um, can you go to the next slide? And when we say uh, it's the Song of Songs, what, it, what the Hebrews are trying to say by that is that it's a really amazing piece of literature, right? It is the best of the best, the song of songs, the God of gods, right? It's the very best. And that's how they treat it. It is, it is this love story that is astounding and astonishing, very much a part of their traditions in the, in the Jewish traditions. The, it was written originally in Aramaic and not Hebrew, actually which is how the only way actually we can try and date when it was written because um, if it was written in Aramaic, it's likely that it happened after the Babylonian Empire or the exile that happened in the sixth century BCE. And so uh, because of its style and the way it was written as a big piece of poetry, 
Um, it kind of sounds like some other poetry that was written in the third century BCE, so that's where they've placed the origin. Uh, we have no idea who the author is or why it was written, but it is presumed that it was written to be like a play or a rite that is performed during some kind of ritualistic um, ceremony like worship. Next slide, please. It's very unique in the type of literature that it is because it's not like the rest of the books that are previous to it in the wisdom literature. It does not try to teach you anything. It does not give you any kind of um, specific requirements for how you can live well in the midst of society. What it is is a really long love poem that is a celebration of love in the world. There are two voices that it is written in, both of which that are e on equal footing with one another, that speak to the yearning and the beauty of each one. The beauty that draws that yearning from one to the other. It's an exquisite love story. And it's people that are drawn together seeking harmony with one another. There is also a Jerusalem chorus, so to speak, that's there. That's a way to draw in the readers and um, the audience as being kind of overhearers of very intimate invitations. And it is one of those books that nobody really talks about partially because it is a love poem and sometimes people blush when they read it, right? Uh, because people whisper about it sometimes and talk about it as being something that you should blush at. Of course, the confirmation students go right down and figure out where it is, right? But the small groups won't talk about it at all. So, you know, there you have it. But it is unique literature, and it is just really exquisite. And it should be something that we do pull out every once in a while and celebrate it, because it is a huge celebration of love. Next slide, please. For the modern day Jews, they use it as uh, part of the Sabbath celebration at, Pentecost, or at Passover. Um, they use it and interpret it as an allegory between the, of a relationship between God, the Creator, and all of Israel. Um, this wonderful, committed relationship of equal partners yearning to be and dwell with one another. Um, and the Christian tradition has then picked up on that allegory interpretation and, and expanded it a bit to include Christ and the church at large, right? Kind of like that language we hear sometimes in the New Testament about bride and bridegroom, Christ and Christ church, right? So it's those marriage partners that we're talking about, that yearning to be with one another, to be in relationship with one another. Next slide, please. So now that we know a little bit more about the Song of Solomon, that it's its own book, about when it was written, what it was written for, and how it's being used even now as scripture in our times, Let's look at the um, text itself. Your channel is an orchard of pomegranates with all the choicest fruits, henna with nard, nard with saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all chief spices, a garden fountain, a well of living water, and flowing streams from Lebanon. Next slide. I come to my garden, my sister, my bride. I gather my myrrh with my spice. I eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. Eat, friends, drink, and be drunk on love. What a marvelous piece of poetry. What a wonderful celebration of what it means to be in relationship. It's a grand use of the lushness of fruits and cinnamons, the richness of the smell, and all that is wonderful and abundant in life. This is God's conversation with creation. The beauty and the majesty and the mystery of which God created the world comes through in this poetry. This is a grand feast, a meal that celebrates love, and we're all invited to be a part of it because we are the reason for it. All of creation, you and I, humans and non-humans alike, are all part of God's delight and God's beauty in the world. 
And this is how God is imagined being in relationship with us, with all of creation in spoken word that invites us to participate in that love with the rest of the world. And through seeing ourselves through God's eyes, we're very much like a parent, perhaps, seeing the world through our children's eyes or having our children see themselves through our eyes, how we love them, how we cherish them, how there is a celebration of love and relationship between us. That kind of relationship is a compellingness that draws us out of ourselves and has us participate with all the rest of the world in a way that reflects the love in which we were created. So by participating with how God views us in the world, we become that which is in fact God's delight and God's beauty in the world. Next slide, please. Does it sound like paradise? Flowing waters, living waters, flowing streams, the land of milk and honey from Canaan? All of that language is part of creation language. And God saw that it was good. That's the celebration of love. That's what God is trying to invite us into and have us dwell together with God as we participate and help co-create all that's around us. But can we see that beauty? Can we see that love and that relationship that dwells in what, how God sees us? Or are we not able to understand that anyone, especially our Creator who knows us inside and out, could possibly love us that much? Oftentimes we deny that or we reject God's image of us just when it's getting really wonderful because we get caught up in our own understandings of where our weaknesses are, where we lack something, instead of seeing ourselves as God sees us, full of wonder and beauty and majesty. Next slide, please. We're going to hear some music. And as we're listening to some music, I would really like for you to spend some time considering these questions. Where do you actually see the world as God sees it? The beauty and the wonder. Where do you see the world as God's delight? And how then are you called by that vision to share the love that you experience? How does that open you up to be a part of somebody else's life, both giving and receiving the love that God shares with each of us. The chocolate room.
in the chocolate room. your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. We'll begin with a spin traveling in the world of my creation what we'll see will defy explanation if you want to view paradise simply look around and view it Anything you want to do it Want to change the world There's nothing to it I know to compare with pure imagination Living there you'll be free If you truly wish to be Love some friends coming down from upstairs. Excellent. Okay, while you're coming up, how many of you have seen that movie? Yeah. Right? How many of you have seen it one million times? Yeah! 
So my little sister and I used to go to a plus video every Friday and force our parents to check it out for us over and over and over again. We would return it and then check it right out again. And then when you could buy it, they bought it, and so we probably never watched it again. Because <laughs> there's something about getting it, right? Getting it off the shelf. Okay, so this week, I thought about those questions that Chris asked us, particularly with that scene. And I tried to remember a time when I specifically felt like those kids felt in that room. Like, did you see their faces? Their faces were so excited and they couldn't wait and they were trying to get down the stairs and Willy Wonka was like, <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly. So I tried to remember. And I came up with one that was very easy to find, and I had pictures for it. So can you advance our slide for us? One slide, or two, or however many you want. So this is a picture, and there's a couple more pictures after this, that came from the Koyo trip to the Boundary Waters. And that was a time that I can remember so vividly thinking, this is the most amazing thing I have ever seen. And the crazy thing about the Boundary Waters and nature and the forest is that every day we woke up, no matter how much the day before we had walked around and looked at all the trees, looked at all the plants low, waited for the animals to come out, no matter how much time we had spent doing that, every day there was new stuff we hadn't, we hadn't seen before. So now that I'm older, and honestly, I have to share with you that I think I probably grew up the moment I watched that scene and I was like that little girl digging into like the chocolate ball. I mean, with A, with her hands, stop. And then B, like she's wearing a really nice dress. There's no sink for washing your hands. No one has any wet wipes. It seemed very impractical. And yes, a very small part of me died that day. So I'm just saying. <laughs> but. As I got older, I got a better appreciation of film and literature, right? And so there's a, several people who believe that that scene was written just like that. And then the film people depicted it just like that. And I don't know if you know this or not, but Willy Wonka has a remake that came out in the early 2000s. And that scene from that movie is even more like actual nature. Like they're drilling into the chocolate dirt of the earth to break it off to put it into the river to start mixing it up. Like they deliberately do that. And so some people believe that it was written like that on purpose so that as we grow, we try to maintain those eyes so that when we see trees and they're not made of candy, we're not like, oh, this is the worst. But we're able to keep those eyes where we see things and we're like, I've never seen this before. This is so cool. So I want you to think about what would happen if every day we walked out into the world, and not just with nature, but with everything, with all of creation and every person that we meet. How would the world be different if we looked with it, at it with those eyes of wonder, seeking out the beauty and the newness and the amazingness that is God's creation? So now, who knows what happens right after that scene in the movie or in the book? What happens? You got it. It's what you think it is. Anybody know? Okay, okay. Well, what, what, Trixie? Okay. Mm -hmm. Somebody falls into the river. Absolutely. Augustus Gloop falls into the river. Falls into the river. And then after that, kids start dropping like flies. <laughs> You know, one of them gets all stretched out, one of them turns into a blueberry, one of them goes down the nut sorter machine and into the trash compactor, and she's fine. She's fine after that. She's totally fine. So here's the other lesson we learn from this movie and this book. Keep your eyes of wonder, but keep the balance. Each of those kids did something, right? that messed up the balance, the relationship that Chris is talking about, that we have with God, that we have with nature, that we have with each other. When it gets out of balance, things get a little crazy. So now we're gonna pray before we head back to our folks. God of many names, help us keep our eyes 
filled with wonder and amazement for all of the things in creation. Amen. Okay. <gasps> you lost a tooth. Oh my gosh. Here? No, I'm just kidding. Slides, please. So I gotta say, if I were to walk in the boundary waters, I wouldn't get that same feeling that, that Rebecca has. But I gotta tell you, walking into the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, Spain, that gave me that feeling. So if you ever get a chance to go see that, go see that. But whenever I wanna get into that place where I feel like I'm overwhelmed with um, daily stuff, daily routine, responsibilities, um, all the stress that goes with all that stuff, I can picture this Willy Wonka set and be amazed all over again. It does bring me back to that place. And now I have a new space, the Sagrada Familia, that helps take me back to that wonder and that mystery. So I hope that it touched that little bit of child in you that opened that up a little bit too, because that is what we're asking of you today is to be able to see the world through God's eyes, to be able to take an intentional walk that looks specifically for beauty and wonder in the world. So from now on, and even before this, right, we were all walking around as if we have just walked in to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, and we're all amazed all the time, and we always see the beauty, right? Well, not always, right? What about your Facebook screens? Are those always wonderful, happy occasions? Are they always things that celebrate love? Mm, probably not, at least not as often as they could be, right? Next slide, please. Instead of the wonder and the mystery, oftentimes, we're smacked in the face with images of children being separated from their family at the border. Or in Syria, families running for their lives, looking for anything in front of them that would act as a shield or protection against the ravages of the war that they live in. Next slide, please. We see images of whales that are washed up on the beach because they've ingested too much plastic, which we throw away. Or glaciers that melt in front of our eyes because we have reached that point of global warming where there is no reversal. And so the waters are accelerating as they rise and threaten life as we know it. And the sun that I used to celebrate Every spring when I could go outside in short sleeves and feel the warmth of the sun on my arms, what a fabulous feeling that was. Now, I have to wear hats. And the sun is a threat to my skin for burning, for cancers. Those are the things we see so often instead of the beauty and the wonder. We're not even close to seeing each other or the world with God's eyes. Next slide, please. So that's my challenge. I'm wondering, have we gone too far? Are we not capable now of being able to see the world as God sees it? What are we doing with God's delight, God's creation? in the world. If we see it only as despair, are we humans doomed to careen into destruction and taking all of creation with us? Or is there a way to reinstill that childlike wonder that we were given in creation, that God reaches out to us with in love and invites us to participate in that deep, committed relationship, that feast of love? that God sets before us. How do we get that back? Next slide, please. 
instead of pointing out each other's weaknesses or competing with one another, when are we gonna get to a point where we can say to one another, if we admire something about another person, tell them. Get into the habit of lifting each other up, not tearing each other down. Don't look for the flaws, look for the beauty intentionally and see how that changes your mood and your actions. There is beauty left in the world. It is all around us. What it takes is an intentional seeing, a change of vision, just shifting your perspective just that much to be able to wonder how God must see this. Next slide, please. There's a woman in our congregation named Donna Knudsen. Do you all know her? If you haven't met her yet, you should. She's not here today. <laughs> but she does this amazing thing. She's one of these people that inspire me because she is intentionally committed to looking for beauty in the world. In fact, she's a writer. And on Facebook, she does a lot of blogs and a lot of poetry and a lot of writing. And at every end of her writing, she does a salutation that says, beauty, comma, Reverend Donna. Beauty is her salutation. That's what she looks for. She posts pictures of flowers like this lily and this rose that she looks for every day. She intentionally goes out on a walk looking for beauty to start her day. When she sees you, she tries to imagine how God sees you so that she can greet you that way. She truly is astonishing. You think she'd walk on water, but she doesn't. The reason she's not here right now is because she is uh, preparing, if she hasn't already left yet, to go to Spain to do the Camino de Santiago, the pilgrimage walk there. She does not have a return ticket. <laughs> So we all have to pray she comes back. <laughs> but she's there looking for beauty. And she'll come back with a whole new perspective again that takes her deeper into that practice of being intentional about looking, about seeing with God's eyes. Next slide, please. And yesterday, I went to the Pride Fest at Baxter Arena where I was surrounded by people who celebrated love, just like in the poetry. As I wandered around from booth to booth collecting my stickers and putting them all over me, and I, had, I gave my bracelets away already this morning to some of the children, but I had rainbow bracelets and I have some tattoos. Look at that. They survived the shower today. I was so impressed. It was an amazing energy that filled the room as I wandered around. I see all of you guys who were there, you all shaking your head. The celebration of love in that place was just astounding. People being who God created them to be and being content with being who God created them to be. Sharing in a relationship with people who they had never met before and became instant friends with. People who they had known forever but don't really spend enough time with. They took the time to stop and talk to one another. And the kids were smiling and laughing because there was color everywhere, rainbows everywhere, free stickers just for fun. We even gave away pretzels with icing on it at our booth. How great is that? I had two. It's a wonderful energy. When you celebrate love in its purest form that builds a relationship with each other, that acknowledges God's presence among you so that you are allowed to open yourself up, to give and to receive love. That's an astounding thing. And that is exactly what Song of Solomon is celebrating that committed relationship that all creation has with each other and with its creator. It's a marvelous feast. Next slide, please. So how long 
do we have to make this an intentional practice of seeing things with new eyes, with God's eyes? How long before our actions and our being literally changes from that which automatically looks for weaknesses to something that automatically looks for beauty and delight? How long before we can offer ourselves as God does in this poem? Come, my beloved. Let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early to the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. What a lovely vision. Next slide, please. There, I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance and over our doors are all choice fruits new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O oh my beloved. Imagine surrounding yourself in a love that draws this kind of poetry from you, that allows you to seek in one another that which God sees. It is, in fact, a holy meal. These fruits, the cinnamon, these spices that are all brought to you as gifts from God. Setting a table of a celebration of love. And it all starts right here at this table of love and reconciliation. The table where Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, looked for the beauty, found the bread, and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you in all love and all beauty. Do it as often as you can in remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup and when he had given things he gave it to all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people in the celebration of love, in the celebration of the creator for the created, for our relationships with one another. May we eat, drink, and be made drunk in love. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. You do not have to be a member at Countryside to partake in this meal. We simply ask that if your heart feels you calling forward, please participate with us. We have gluten-free wafers available from our servers. We also um, can serve you right where you are. If you just raise your hand, we can do that. And if you decide not to participate with us, that's okay too. We want you to be who you are created to be and called to be. This is the place for that. But if you do decide to participate with us, we ask that you tear a piece of the bread from the loaf and you dip it in the juice. And as you take it into yourself, you imagine that pure imagination that allows you to see God's love in you and in your neighbor and in all of creation, a love so deep that it compels us out of ourselves and into the world to share this wonderful celebration of love. We as a community of faith profess our mission in this participation with God through our mission statement. We, next slide please. We are an inclusive, open, and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse, yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite our servers forward.